everyone. Uh, it's good to be here. I've, um, I'm proud to be probably one of the longest serving faculty members in this workshop outside of Francis. Uh, been involved in this series of workshops since uh, I think the year 2000. So that's a long time. And I keep coming back every year because uh, I enjoy it. It's a great way to meet people and uh, interact with people across the country and different parts of the of the land who are interested in this field and so um, very very pleased to be here. So today we're just talking about somatic copy number alterations. Before we get into that I thought I'd just give you a little bit of a background. So um, my work centers around understanding properties of the cancer genome and how tumor cell populations evolve in different contexts and um, and really making use of these wonderful new measurement devices that we call next-gen sequencing devices um, to study cancer genomes uh, at the very essence of um, a, a nucleotide resolution. And that involves uh, a quite a diverse array of expertise and knowledge bases and, uh, and also uh, is really a multidisciplinary science. So it's very collaborative work. Uh, and but it's, uh, it is becoming increasingly computational in nature. And, um, but I would just put that into context in the sense that we do a lot of algorithm statistical modeling um, development in the group. And my PhD is actually in computer science. So uh, I did a PhD with Kevin Murphy a few years ago. And, uh, and I think you've probably heard from a couple of people who actually have formal training and whose PhDs are in, in, in the computational sciences. And, but the, the way I work things in my lab is, is really um, try to be focused on certain biological questions. And so we, we have a biological question. We're taking measurements uh, using these devices. And then we ask, OK, well, what, uh, where is the computational gap? Where is the statistical modeling gap? And try to fill that. So we can answer the biological question of interest. So it all comes from that scientific perspective, either clinical or biological. And uh, but so we really run the spectrum of, um, of also, so the other aspect is that we do a lot of method development, we publish a lot of papers um, in, in methods journals. But I always have a view that um, a method is always best developed if there's going to be an application data set on the other side of it. And so, uh, and so in parallel, uh, we've published a lot of papers that are applying those methods to, to new data sets to gain new biological insights. And that's really when the magic happens. So if you innovate on a computational perspective and you learn something biological that you couldn't have seen before without that innovation, that's, uh, that's really when, when uh, we get quite excited. Uh, so this is my group. Uh, I have a group of about 25 people in Vancouver, and it ra ranges from uh, I have five postdocs and, and a number of students, and then, but I also have a number of, of core staff that, um, that uh, do a lot of the data analysis, the day-to-day -day data analysis. So we build a lot of computational workflows that are, are reproducible, and, and we have a lot of collaborations with people and also generate data from, from, from our own perspective. And, um, and, and analyze those data through, um, through pipelines and high-performance computing environments. So, so that's kind of the background of, of where I'm coming from. All right, so today we're going to cover um, a fair number of topics with respect to copy number alterations. Um, the, this is the outline, so we'll talk about biological relevance and impact. Uh, we'll talk about some of the measurement technologies that are available, and um, in particular, high-density genotyping arrays and also uh, next-gen sequencing. Uh, and then we'll get into some advanced topics at the end, uh, given some time. So we've got a, a two-hour block, and I probably have maybe just over an hour's worth of prepared material. So, so let's have a lot, lot lively discussion. Feel free to interrupt at any time. Usually if I prepare half an hour of material, sometimes that's enough to um, end up eliciting a nice discussion. So, so I think we're going to be still pressed for time, but, but so don't be shy at all about interrupting and we can um, discuss anything that comes to your mind. Okay, so how many people know what this is? Have you ever seen something like this before? Yeah, so shout it out. What is it? It's a 
How is this? Uh, yeah, how is this generated? Anybody know? No. Yeah. So, so metaphase spreads and chromosomal painting techniques called spectral karyograms. So, what this is is showing um, essentially is showing the organization of how DNA uh, is, is organized in the cell in twenty three pairs of chromosomes. I should also ask, actually, before we really get into this, so how many people come from a pure computational engineering statistics background? Okay, and the rest are biological. How about basic science and biology? And clinical. Fantastic. And the clinical are you pathologists or oncology specialists or oncology? Yeah. Hematology. Okay. Okay. Great. Excellent. So we've got a really great. We, if we all put our heads together, we could solve cancer genomics. This is great. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, <coughs> good. So okay. So this is a, 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 a human karyotype that really illustrates that there are two copies of, of, your, of, of a genome in every cell, and one comes from your mother, one comes from your father, uh, and in the, in the initial uh, formation of a zygote. So, so that's what really uh, your normal cells should look like that. Um, so in, as far as 100 years ago, uh, Theodore Bovary hypothesized when looking at sea urchin nuclei. So sea urchin nuclei are, are very large. They can be looked at with low power microscopy. <coughs> he was studying these nuclei and looking at their replication rates and their growth rates. And he noticed that occasionally there would be a clone or a group of cells that started dividing rapidly, more rapidly than others. And he associated that with an, a, a, an acquisition of an extra chromosome, I think it was chromosome six, that he called it. Uh, and those cells went on to divide much faster than the cells that didn't have that extra copy. So this is, incre this is an incredible leap, if you can think about it. But he, he actually made this association. He said, well, maybe this is the origin of human malignancy, that there is a change in chromosomes that leads to uh, this uh, additional growth rate. So, um, so this is really quite um, prescient. And, and he was proven correct in 1960 with the discovery of the Philadelphia chromosome in CML. And I believe he would have covered that yesterday in the, in the gene fusion lab. Um, so, so it's an endogenous factor. It's, it's a, we, our chromosomes change, our DNA, our genomes change, in order to drive malignancy and, and acquire a new phenotype. So if we contrast the picture I showed you before with this one, this is a high-grade serous ovarian cancer. Uh, and this is probably the most, uh, the cancer type that has the most genomic disruption <coughs> of all human malignancies, at least of the common types. Uh, and you can see that um, there are, this is six different tumors. And you can see these tumors resemble nothing like the picture I showed you before. So we have acquisitions of extra copies of certain chromosomes. We have exchange of information of different chromosomes. Um, so let me just see if I can uh, use this pointer here. Um, so here's, for example, uh, an exchange of information. We've got two different chromosomes come together. Uh, here's one that's much more even complex than that, um, and, and, and so on and so on. And some, some chromosomes uh, uh, have a reduced uh, amount of material as well. So you can have acquisition of copy, extra copies of material, and you can have actually removal of material as well. So, so this is actually a hallmark of, of most cancers. Not, uh, some, some cancers actually have a fairly diploid uh, genomes, but um, for, for a large number of the solid tumors that are the very aggressive malignancies, this is, um, this is actually a, a common phenomenon. So then just from a very basic perspective, uh, you can imagine that these copy number variations are just losses or gains of genetic material. And so you can have, uh, a, as very simple, uh, you can have a deletion. So here's a Here's a mark or a locus that's lost in one chromosome. Here's a duplication uh, in the chromosome. And, and, or you could have even duplication, deletion first followed by duplication. We'll go over those examples. So this is a picture of a summary of a 1,000 breast cancers that show uh, the level of copy number amplifications in red going up and um, the proportion of cases with copy number deletions in blue going down. 
and, uh, and the chromosomes uh, arrayed out on the x-axis. This is like taking the genome and putting it flat, stringing it out into a string, and then looking at what, uh, how many cases or out, of a th out of a thousand have a copy number alteration or deletion at that locus. You can see that almost the whole genome has some level of frequency of alteration. Uh, and this is across all, for all types of breast cancer, so ER positives, ER negatives, et cetera. So, and in some cases, you have uh, events like this, where you have 50% of all breast cancers have an amplification of chromosome 1Q. Okay, it's a major feature of the disease. And if you really zoomed in, um, so there's a little spike here. You can see that right here. Okay, so that's the ERB2 locus that constitutes 15% um, of breast cancers have amplification in ERB2. It is the, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that uh, in, t in detail. And you can see that throughout there are, um, there are deletions as well. So, so here you have a uh, deletion of, of chromosome 17. This happens to be where uh, TP53 sits, so there's often mutation of P53 followed by deletion of the wild type locus. Um, here you have uh, uh, a pattern of um, deletion and amplification of the, two, uh, of the two arms of a particular chromosome that's called an isocentric chromosome. That's a common feature of breast cancers as well. So, so we can study uh, from a very high resolution perspective. This is about a 1 kb, 1.5 kb uh, resolution, where we look at um, uh, that, that, that type of uh, uh, marks, and we can really start to zero in on where, where copy number changes are actually occurring in the genome. OK, so, so why are copy number changes important? Well, the first is that uh, the major concept here is that of course, we have genes that are uh, encoded in the genome. And so if you have a deletion of a particular locus that harbors um, a gene that whose function it is to have, for example, keep genomic integrity intact or, um, or to uh, suppress growth under normal conditions, if we remove that locus, that gene can no longer be expressed, that protein can no longer act in the cell. And, uh, and so, uh, so then that allows cells to evade the, the normal checkpoints that uh, keep a, a cell functioning as it should. On the other side, if you have amplification of material uh, where that contains a gene whose, uh, whose role it is to promote growth and proliferation, we have extra copies through gene dosage, and you're going to have lots of protein in the cell that's, that's driving uh, those. And those are typically associated with biochemical cascades. They drive entire pathways. Uh, and overexpress um, pathways, and that's how uh, the cells acquire that particular phenotype. So, the the most important association here is that copy number changes can lead to changes in gene expression, and that in turn, of course, leads to the abundance of a protein in the cell. Changes in the abundance of protein in the cell, um, and and many copy number changes have been associated with um, uh, with mechanisms of tumor genesis, but also can be used for uh, for prognostic purposes uh, and for diagnostic purposes as well. Okay, any questions so far? Uh, back at the genomic landscape of uh, breast cancer, so the, uh, a normal sample would look pretty much flat. It would be very, yeah. So, so this is, don't forget, this isn't one sample. This is a collection of a thousand, this is a synthesis of a thousand cases. Oh, okay. Okay, so what's shown on the, on the y-axis is the proportion of patient, uh, tumors that have a particular alteration at that locus. Is there something similar just for one? Yes, yeah, we'll see that. We'll see what that looks like. Okay. Yes? So you said the copy number, change in the copy number can lead to changes in the gene expression. Mm -hmm. um, for clinical application, how common is it for people to run both copy number analysis and gene expression analysis on the same cell? Yeah, it's a great, great question. So, I mean, gene expression analysis in general turns out to be um, uh, not the most reliable measurement. Um, so, so people typically use actually protein expression through immune histochemistry in a clinical environment, uh, or uh, they use um, a technique called fluorescence in situ hybridization, which is uh, a very old school technique. It's been around for decades, but it's very reliable in the sense that we can um, take a probe. Uh, fluorescent probe and it gets incorporated in, into the nuclei 
uh, of the cell, and, and so then can light up whether uh, the number light up for every copy that uh, exists in that in that cell's nucleus. We see a spot, and and usually either through um, experienced technologists um, actually look at it manually and, and, and do some scoring through through just kind of SOP algorithms, or now it's sort of shifting over to automated counting of these uh, markers in the clinical environment. So it, we're still in a, in, a, in a world in the clinical environment where it's either fluorescent sensitivity hybridization or immunohistochemistry. Um, there are some gene expression profiling assays that are coming online now. Like you may have heard of Oncotype DX, for example, for breast cancer, uh, or, or uh, the, pro, the, the competing product, which is ProSigna, um, which is based on the PAM50 classifier. So, so these are actually RNA extracted from paraffin, um, and they are, but they're really meant to do um, breast cancer subtyping and risk recurrence score. So it's a slightly different um, thing that they're measuring. So, so those those are the the clinical applications are for RNA are typically in these kind of gene expression profiling cases where if you're looking for like amplification of RB2 for example, if you're looking for HER2 positive, it's either done by immunohistochemistry or or by fish. We found using array so we found using arrays that um, both can be problematic and actually you know, arrays are probably more accurate, but it's going to take time to work that into the clinic. You can't find some novel things with fish, and you can't find the smaller, like, um, you can't find one KB, two KB, KB long. Correct. No, so, but in a clinical, he's asking about a clinical environment, so you have to know what you're testing, obviously, right? So, so it's not a discover. so fish is not a discovery platform by any means. It's, it's, you're looking for one, doing a test, is this locus amplified? And you get your answer. It's not what loci are amplified in the whole genome. That's a different question. OK. Good. OK, so there are uh, several different classes of, um, of CNBs that uh, are associated with uh, different abnormalities. Um, and uh, so I just realized here that um, we probably have uh, very outdated uh, terminology here. We should probably, I'm going to fix this right now. I think this is called intellectual disability is better. There we go. Um, there we go. Okay, so, um, so you can imagine that... Uh, we can have de novo acquisition of changes uh, from uh, two parents, and um, and the child is born with uh, with in the zygote is born with uh, a particular uh, marker in the genome, and that can lead to uh, congenital abnormalities where where um, usually associated with uh, uh, intellectual disability or mo impaired motor function. Then we have uh, somatic alterations, which are acquired mutations in, in specific tissues, and these are usually associated with malignancies uh, and, and are really uh, contained in most, if not all, cancers. And then, of course, we have uh, many benign variations in our genomes, which actually just distinguish, uh, end up distinguishing normal human traits. So. Or, or even not at all. So, so they can have no effect on phenotype whatsoever. But, um, but, but Copy number variations in the human population actually have been you know, have been really underappreciated, and it really wasn't until about um, 2006, 2007 that we really realized that in fact more than 10% of the genome, and some a lot of that work was done here in Toronto, uh, is actually affected by uh, copy number variations, and, and actually leads to variation in human populations. So um, so that's uh, that was actually some something fairly new on the landscape and. Um, and in, in many respects, uh, you can imagine that because copy number variations are, are, are large chunks that may be a KB or more, in aggregate, they actually affect more of the genome than, than single nucleotide polymorphisms in, in, many, in many cases. Um, okay, so moving on then. So in, in, in cancer, we can have several classes of, of, of changes. We'll call these segmental aneuploidies are often large scale. Um, so large scale, when I say large scale, is occupying a large part of the genome. It's usually a chromosome arm level event or a whole chromosome event, and um, and these are 
uh, these are common, uh, but they're all, all often low amplitude, so you may just get a single copy gain of a chromosome, for example, or, or a single copy deletion. Because it may be de deleterious to the cell to actually wipe out an entire chromosome, uh, two copies of an entire chromosome, for example, or gain many, many copies of an entire chromosome. And then we have, uh, to contrast that, we have focal copy number alterations. So these are deletions and amplifications um, of high amplitude that typically target just one or just a few genes. And, and a classic example of this would be the RB2 locus, for example. Um, and these can be uh, very good indicators of driver events. So these are, these are events that, are, that could be likely to be changing phenotype or driving a, a signaling cascade in a cell. And then you've heard yesterday about uh, rearrangements. And, and typically we have um, a, a rearrangement will often lead to deletion of material or amplification of material. And so, it, so actually they're the same event, um, but we haven't been able to until very recently with next gen technology in a high throughput way be able to simultaneously read off rearrangements of copy numbers. We're just do, able to do that now. It's in the last two, three years. That's become a possibility. So, so we see changes in the genome. We think about the genome as this linear construct, and we look at copies of, uh, at each locus. But in fact, um, we, you may have changes in copies that are also have um, scrambling of the genome associated with that as well. I'll show you some pictures of that later on. OK. So this is just a list here of, uh, of known copy number alterations in cancer that are, are what we call actionable. So actionable su really suggests that um, there's a drug uh, that can be administered in the presence of that particular event that uh, would be able to be targeted and have some effect on the treatment outcome of a patient. And so the classic examples here are, uh, are ERB2. So here it is here. Um, who knows what ERB2 is? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Share that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's a gene. Yeah, yeah. What, what's its significance in? Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, so, so I, I call it the um, the poster child for personalized medicine. We go on and on about personalized medicine and what is personalized medicine. Well, nobody really knows what that is, but um, so don't believe anybody when they say what they know what personalized medicine is. But, um, but nonetheless, it, it is uh, it is the marker I think that uh, we all point to. Uh, this is the thing that we're all looking for because this is a uh, an amplification that happens in the genome. 50% of 15% of, of, of breast cancer tumors, and it used to be that women that had that type of breast cancer uh, had really were sentenced to death. It was it was uh, a very highly aggressive uh, phenotype, and then in the 90s uh, there was an antibody developed against it. I think Dennis Lehman uh, originally did it, and then. Genentech took it over and developed um, this drug called Herceptin. And, uh, and so now, um, I think the first patient was administered something in the late 80s. Uh, she was administered, and she's still alive today. Um, and uh, it's pretty amazing. So, so you've taken a, a very highly aggressive disease and essentially made it, um, uh, changed its outcome trajectory dramatically. So the five-year survival rate for her 2 positive breast cancers is actually um, not bad uh, relative to what it was. It's still not perfect. It's not 100 percent, but um, but it's it's much much better than what it was. So so this is in cancer research. This is what we strive to find: um, a target, develop a drug, change the outcome trajectory of patients. So um, so so that's um, and there are other examples uh, as well. But that is by far the most uh, the biggest success story uh, in the last. Um, few decades. So in general, um, copy number profiles um, indicate, so how do these things occur? And it's usually through a, a compromised DNA repair pathway. So um, in, in high-grade serous ovarian cancer, for example, it's homologous recombination um, that repairs double-strand breaks in the genome on cell division. And, um, and through 
usually through disruption of uh, BRCA1 or BRCA2, either through germline, somatic, or methylation, uh, there, those cells have compromised the ability to repair double-strand breaks. And so copy number changes can accumulate. And to the point where um, you get the spectral karyograms that I, that I showed you earlier. And in this study, uh, which is a th synthesis of the TCGA, surely you've been um, introduced to the TCGA by now? Yes. Okay, good. So if I say TCGA, you know what I'm talking about? Okay, great. So, so this is, um, perhaps you've even seen this figure. Uh, so this is a study of uh, 12 different tumor types uh, after the first phase of the TCGA and shows on, on a spectrum of whether cancers are affected by point mutations um, versus copy number changes. And so there are two classes of these uh, point mutation uh, phenotype and the copy number alteration phenotype. And you can see that ovarian cancer here is by far uh, the, 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 the tumor with the most copy number changes and associated with the most copy number changes. And, and the interesting thing about this, um, this study is it showed that really um, tumors can acquire DNA repair deficiency and mismatch repair. So that's that they accumulate single nucleotide changes or have changes in um, DNA repair pathways like homologous recombination, which repair double-strand breaks, but you rarely see tumors with both because that's going to be essentially synthetically lethal to the cell, and, and those cells just won't be able to cope with having two DNA repair mechanisms altered. So you often see one or the other, and there's this mutual exclusion event. So, so today we're talking about um, tumors on this end of the spectrum, and this afternoon we can it would, it would be more applicable to uh, tumors on this end of the spectrum. Okay. So, mm -hmm. so the bottom one is SNP changes, and the top one is. Sorry, SNP. no. So the top one is SNB, so single nucleotide changes, and the okay. bottom is is copy number changes. Point. I put the reference here. Um, it's actually worthwhile reading if you want sort of a high level overview synthesis of the of the TCJ data set. This is a, a decent paper to to look at. So, so the pattern of, of, uh, of copy number change can, can also then be potentially used to stratify different cancers into these different groups. And, and, and so it, it itself, even though it's, um, it is it's something in the genome, it's essentially the, the pattern of copy number change or the abundance of copy number change can essentially be used as a phenotypic classifier because it tells us what DNA repair uh, abnormalities are, are uh, compromised in the cell. Okay, so... So this is essentially now coming back to your question about what does it look like in a, in a single tumor. This is, this is a single tumor now, okay? So we often see, you'll often see pictures like this um, when studying copy number changes. So what's shown here is just the, um, the karyogram. And, uh, and so this is the chromosomal banding pattern um, shown on the x-axis here. And, uh, and sh shown here is essentially the, um, uh, the number of megabases across uh, the x-axis here. And the y-axis tells you uh, the uh, estimated number of copies of, of that particular locus. And each dot here, this is a, a Affymetric SNP6 array. And that's probably the still the most used platform uh, for copy number change um, measurement. Yeah? So zero actually diploid? So zero is diploid, yeah, that's right. Yeah. So this is relative copy number, not to normal, rather than absolute copy number. Um, so, uh, so the um, each dot here represents a particular probe on the array, and those probes are uh, ordered according to where they sit on the genome, and uh, just literally spatially ordered according to their their chromosomal coordinate, and then the y-axis here is essentially a reflection of hybridization intensity uh, of, of, of DNA to, to that particular probe. Um, so, so you can measure with, um, with a camera and take a picture and, and measure the, in, the fluorescence intensity of that particular locus. Uh, and then we can measure that relative to uh, a control or um, sometimes a pooled normal as well. And so this is, uh, this is the unambiguous signal. Um, you don't need any fancy machinery to look at this and say that locus is amplified. 
so, uh, so we have, um, this is the Erby 2 locus. And you can see here that it really only constitutes um, a, f a small part of the genome. You can imagine if the whole chromosome had this many copies, it would very likely be deleterious to the cell, and, and that just that clone that acquired that would never really survive. So, um, so that that's what a Erb2 locus looks like. This one here, okay. So that's um, so that's a low-level amplification. So that, so it's, it's probably a duplication of the telomere, the telomeric end there, um, and. Very likely that's a translocation as well. Yeah. And very close to the centromere, there will also be red spots that Yeah, so that's likely, very likely noise. The centromere regions are very, very difficult to study because they're highly repetitive. And, um, and so typically, what, in order to cope with that, people ignore the centromere. Uh, centromeric regions because they're essentially uninterpretable. It's not to say that there aren't associations of phenotype with changes in, um, in genetic material at the centromere, but um, they're very, very different. It's a signal-to-noise problem. Yeah. When you run a SNP-6 chip, do you mm -hmm. typically run it on, say, just one tumor-derived sample, or do you usually use a tumor-normal pair? Yeah, it's a great question. So in many situations, um, tumor banks uh, will have, if you do a retrospective sample, um, sometimes the normal isn't available. So, uh, so in, with respect to copy number changes, um, this type of thing is, is un un unambiguous and, and is always going to be somatic. Um, so you never, you don't actually need the normal to interpret this particular change. But I'll show you other examples whereby um, having the normal is quite important because um, if you know what you're looking for and, and you see an amplification in Erby2, there's no way that that would um, uh, result in a viable zygote if, if that was in the germline. It just that those cells just wouldn't wouldn't be able to proliferate and make a normal human being. But in in certain cases, um, we do see because of germline copy number variation, um, we see changes that look like they could be quite interesting, but but in fact are in the germline and, and are likely not driving malignancy. So um, generally speaking, it's better to have a tumor normal pair. That's not not absolutely necessary. And so in, a, in, a, in the study that I'll talk to you about, uh, only about a quarter of the cases out of 2,000 cases actually had match normal. Um, and we were able to pull out a lot of um, interesting biology out of that data set. But, so did you just use a standard sample that has no known? Yeah, so, so what we actually did is um, we created a pooled reference out of the, the 450 cases for which we had normal and then ran the tumor against that pooled reference. Yeah. And you can download these pooled references as well for if you're using AFI. So, so if, you don't, if you have a tumor sample that you want to examine without, and you don't have the match normal, then you can use these pooled references. And you just pull down the data set and you use it as part of the analysis. Yeah, yeah. so you can, you, can, you can do that. You can use HapMap for that. You can use 1,000. You know, the, the HapMap did something like 1,000 cases, normal cases. It gives you some reasonable pool of normals to work with. Yes? Is this, is this, is this the profile one case or more than a thousand? This is one tumor here. Yeah, this is just one tumor. Yeah. So there are two uh, of the number that like, that to so Yeah, that's right. And, and this, is, this is a vast underestimate. Um, very likely, so this says 20 copies, but, um, but that's because in hybridization, intensity has an upper bound in terms of how, how much resolution you can actually find. And in many cases, you'll see, for example, 100 or 200 copies of the locus um, in their B2. Yes? The copy number 10 changes would be tissue specific. Correct. So these are only in the cancer. Right. These are only in the breast epithelium. Breast epithelium. That, that's so, malignant. So when you're using a pool of normal, that kind of tissue in the tissue you're looking at? Oh, no, not necessarily. So in the G, I mean, okay, so, so then you have, right, okay, so you do have uh, somatic changes that uh, in different parts of, uh, of certainly of the anatomy, but it's not like gene expression. So most of it is quite conserved. Um, you do have, for example, in the brain, 
you often have tandem duplications of uh, certain regions, and it's thought that that allows the brain to acquire certain plasticity. Um, are there any neuro people in here, in the room? Um, nervous system folks, no? Um, that, but, um, and the, so there's, there is a very nice paper um, a couple, maybe two years ago, that really showed that there can be genomic copy number changes in the brain. Uh, in brain tissues and different tissues, uh, and that it was thought that that gives rise to um, to difference in plasticity. Um, there are also, of course, the classic example is T cells and B cells, um, which rearrange their genomes um, to to allow for um, immune surveillance and, and in response to antigens. So that can happen, and we probably underappreciate um, make this assumption that the genome is stable in all of our different tissues, very likely we, we, that's probably a false assumption. But that is the assumption that's generally made. Yeah. Okay, any more questions about this is fundamental. This is kind of, this is what we're after. We're trying to want to take a tumor and produce something like this. Yeah. Sorry, when you said relative copy number, um, is that like those DNA dense regions? Or is it the same number of probes? Uh. Or? Right, so, so the, the probes are not uniformly spaced, actually, across the genome, as much as they tried to do that in the design. For this is for AFI, SNP6. Um, so, but we, we tend to make the assumption that they are. Some of the statistical models can adjust for that, and, and the tool, some of the tools we visit today in the lab adjust for the variance in adjacent, distance between adjacent probes. But on average, about 1.5 kb. Okay. <clears throat> okay, yeah? So, to get your copy number, you're looking at the intensity of your probes. Mm -hmm. And then you get a relative value from there. And then you sort of compare it to a normal? Or how are you bringing Yeah, so that's, that's right. We'll, we'll, we'll get into that. Okay. okay. So, so we took a, uh, this is now fluorescence in situ, in situ hybridization. So if you took a, a fish probe, and this is a clinical fish probe, um, this is actual tumor that, that I've worked with, and, um, and we can study. So each one of these blue blobs is a, essentially a nucleus, and, um, and you can see that there's a control probe in green, and, and an actual, and the HER2 probe is in, is in red. And in each cell, you'd expect to see two green dots and um, and two red dots if it was di if it was deployed. Okay, and you can see here that there are just hundreds of copies of of um, of her two in this particular in these particular cells. Okay. Just curious, what control did you use? Um, I think it's the centromere in this case. Yeah, I can't remember. It, this is actually the clinical assay, so I didn't even look into what the control is because I didn't have to design it. Um, all right, so you can see that for, for clinical purposes, this is unambiguous. You just look at it and say, okay, um, there are, this, is, this is easy to decide whether something is amplified or not. Okay, so then uh, you can imagine what the impact of that is uh, on, on the expression. So, so we have hundreds of copies, and, um, and, and here what we did in a large series, this is, uh, this is the Metabrick series that I'll talk, to, I'll talk a little bit about in detail. Um, we looked at the correlation of copy number with gene expression. And here's a, a few examples of genes that are dramatically affected um, uh, quite, uh, and really uh, quite stunningly affected by, by copy number change. And so uh, copy number on the x-axis and gene expression on the y-axis. And what's interesting is that, uh, and so the dots are colored according to their predicted copy number state. So the greens are deletions, the blues are neutral, and then the reds are increasing copy number. So the correlation doesn't really kick in until uh, you can see for the neutrals, uh, you have this spread across the vertical that really suggests that there's no correlation at all. Um, and but when we when we start to get into the red points, um, there's a there's a very uh, 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 measurable response of expression from copy number, okay? And then you can see this in the, in the case. Um, so, so GRAB7 is um, this gene here. This is actually just adjacent to ERB2 on chromosome 17. So it often comes along for the ride. And, and so people are, are, people have studied GRAB7 for a long time as a potential oncogene. But um, 
you know, there's some debate as to whether it has uh, is functional in, in, in breast cancer or not, but it, it you know it definitely is co-amplified almost always with RB2. You never see Grab7 amplified on its own, so that tells you that maybe it's just a passenger. Um, here's uh, the 11Q13 locus. This is another uh, of these focal uh, high-level amplifications in, in breast cancer. And, and this, this locus is associated with uh, ER-positive breast cancers, typically not HER2-positive breast cancers. So it's mutually exclusive to HER2. And, um, and you can see here that there are a couple of genes uh, in this locus um, that are uh, driven to have almost exactly the same pattern as RB2 and Grab7. So uh, once you get into the amplification uh, range of the x-axis, you see a really dramatic response in expression. And, and so we can use this as a potential guide to tell us which genes are likely to be impacting um, the behavior of the cell. Any questions on this? Yeah. I'm sorry, is that mutually exclusive with HER2? Mutually exclusive with HER2, yeah. How do you get the expression? This is, a, sorry, yeah, so I should mention that. Um, this, is a, this is just a gene expression array. It's the Illumina um, beta rays. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the correlation is done, mm -hmm. it's calculated for all the points. There's no, there's no correlation value calculated here. I'm just, just showing the, 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 the raw data, just the data points here. But there's, there's a Spearman. Uh, oh, I see. You're right. I take that back. Um, yeah, so it's over everything. So it would be better, though, to, to, create, to, to calculate that as a mixture. So where we calculate each state independently. And it'd be a much stronger correlation in the red points than, for example, the blue points. Is that the practice, or is that how it's done? Well, so that it would be better to do it that way. Um, so you, we, sorry, I realized now that that is there. But um, I think it's just there out of convenience uh, more than anything. But I, you know, I wouldn't interpret that, that okay. correlation because I think it doesn't make sense to treat the copy neutral cases the same as the yeah, yeah, I guess coming that's my question. Yeah, do we, do I would we separate. separate. Yeah, if you have if you have a population of a thousand cases, and um, uh, then 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 you yeah, I would separate them out for sure. Yeah. Yes. So the amplification is measured with microwave, right? So how do you classify something as being amplified versus neutral? With we'll get to that. Okay. That's coming. Good questions. Okay. So, okay, we talked a lot about uh, amplification. So, this is what a homozygous deletion looks like. So, this is an actual uh, tumor. Uh, this is an ovarian cancer, and and actually, this this is a maybe a little bit more representative slide of, of all the types of things that you might expect to see. Um, and I, and I li literally just. Um, pluck this out uh, of, of a study that we're, we're doing right now. And so this is real-time um, real uh, teaching here. And, and this, is, um, this is actually copy number estimated from whole genome sequencing. So what I showed you before was, was AFI SNP6. And this is whole genome sequencing. And, and what you can see is that, I mean, it looks quite similar, right? That's, that's quite nice. So, so we can use a lot of the same conceptual algorithmic tools to estimate copy number from whole genome sequencing as, as, as we can for AFI SNP6. And there's a lot of statistical machinery over the course of 10 years that was developed for SNP, AFI SNP6. And we, we tend to borrow some of that um, when looking at a whole genome. So what's shown here is um, you probably went over, have been over uh, read depth um, as a concept in terms in, in terms of sequencing data, and so this is um, read depth. Con consider this normalized read depth. In this case, uh, whenever doing whole genome sequencing, uh, I would always advocate that you have a normal, a match normal. Never do a never sequence a tumor without a match normal. Uh, interpreting single nucleotide variants uh, without a match normal is um, is very very difficult, and so. Here we show copy number relative to the match normal. And, um, and so here you have a red. Uh, so of course, when we, when we get the data out and we, and we normalize the VDEF um, according to various factors, which I'll talk about later, 
um, all these points would be color, they wouldn't have color associated with them, they should be black. And then we, then we actually process it with a hidden Markov model and try to classify each segment uh, according to uh, whether they're amplified, neutral and blue, deleted and green. And here you have um, a very, very clear homozygous deletion. And so, again, you would rarely expect to see a homozygous deletion that's much bigger than the locus that's about that size. Because taking out um, both copies are gone. And so if you remove both copies of a gene in a cell, uh, that very likely is going to have a deleterious effect on the cell if, uh, if it's an important gene in, in that cell's function. But occasionally, uh, selection will operate to, um, to select for cells that have deletions of, of very tight loci. Again, usually they're tumor suppressors or growth, um, growth regulators of some kind. And, um, and so this is, this is probably a, a, lo a locus that um, contains maybe three or four genes at the most. Very likely just one. Okay, so and here's a little amplification here, just for good measure. Yeah, so, so that, that's the next, the bottom plot there. So I'm just about to get to that. Yes? Is this an evenly tiled window, or is it an right. alternate number of windows? Uh, with the same number of reads and norms, right? So these are 1KB windows. And um, that is typically... Um, so you have to treat that with some caution uh, because uh, the GC content of that 1KB window actually it has a dramatic effect on um, in library construction for next-gen sequencing. This tends to be a bias for high GC content um, nucleotides. And, uh, and so I'll show at the, the end of the lecture, actually, when we get into the technical part about copy network, about analysis, that we really have to normalize for GC content. And the other concept is um, this concept of mappability. I don't know if you've talked about mappability. Yeah, no. Yes, no, yes. no. Yeah. OK. <laughs> Some people weren't listening, maybe. <laughs> um, uh, so, so mappability is essentially the ability to uniquely map reads to a particular part of the genome. And so that actually has an impact on, on the readout, as you can imagine. So, um, so if you have highly mappable regions, you'll get lots of reads there. If you have regions of low mappability, they'll, be, um, they'll actually be uh, paradoxically lower um, read counts there. So that needs to be adjusted for as well. So, so this is a highly sort of post-processed read count, if you will, uh, of 1KB windows. This is whole genome. Can you do this with exome? Yeah. So um, yes, uh, but th whole genome is better. Whole genome is best. AFI SNP six is second best. Exome is third best. <laughs> Where does the RACGH fit in that? Ray CGH is too old school. Yeah. Just don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, that's not true. Um, so, so in, in some cases, uh, uh, in some, especially in paraffin embedded tissues, um, where you have highly fragmented DNA, uh, one has to then resort to lower resolution technology, um, and sometimes the ACGs, and then also Illumina. Um, sorry, Affymetrix also has a um, a platform that's designed for tissues that are fixed in in formalin, and uh, that's going to work better than their AFI-SNP-6 platform. Essentially, you have to have frozen material for AFI-SNP-6. So they have a, this, I think it's called OncoScan, or yeah. OncoScan, yeah. Yes? So can the read number actually reliably be used to detect copy number variation, given that there's varying coverage by reads throughout the genome? Yeah, so, so this, th th that's what this is. So, so it looks pretty good. Uh, <laughs> and there's a, there's a homozygous deletion that you could not miss. Right. That's, that's a pretty tight locus there. So what are sort of the, the typical sensitivity specificity measures? Yeah, that, so we've done a lot of work in that area. Um, I'll reference a couple of papers uh, that show sort of head-to-head -head comparisons of where we have to use. So you have, the problem is you, you often have to use a, a, a lower, uh, an inferior technology as ground truth and then measure sensitivity specificity against a new technology against that. 
and and that's not always ideal, but, but there are a lot of groups who have done that, and there are a few papers that have compared the ability of um, to detect um, copy number changes from uh, whole genome sequencing and, and, for example, SNP6 from the same DNA extraction. So you start with the same DNA extraction and do a head-to-head -head, um, analysis. There's a lot of variation. There's a lot of variables there at work there, though, because the algorithms for SNP6, for example, are designed for SNP6. And then often you have algorithms that are really don't work. You can't work out of the box on whole genome data. And so you have at least two variables. You have the platform and the algorithm. And that starts to get pretty complicated in terms of deconvoluting what's actually constituting the change that you might see. Uh, but by and large, um, I've done enough of this now that uh, re unambiguously whole genome sequencing, especially the new PCR-free tag mutation libraries, um, are the best way to look at copy number changes. It's also by far the most expensive way. So that often comes into the decision-making process. Yeah. So why wouldn't that theory be better than HSOM when you're looking at regions which are actually expressed? Yeah, so, well, well, the exome, if you use the 50 megabase platform, is um, does not comprehensively cover the transcribed regions of the genome, first of all. Um, and second is that you have introduced um, into the, so, so there is this variation we talked about in library construction, the GC content mappability. With exomes, you introduce a third source of variant variation, which is the ability of the exome design um, and the uniformity of hybridization across the exome. So you have um, the hybridization component is variable across the exome. Even in a diploid genome, you'll see really massive changes in, in hybridization. And so that impacts um, the ability to resolve copy number changes, obviously. And in SNP6 data, um, there's much more uniformity of coverage across uh, across the genome, and um, and you have 1.8 million uh, data points to work with. Whereas the exome, if you're binning by you know, one KB bins, for example, then you, you start the resolution starts to get pretty pretty small. You get 50,000. <coughs> possible to do this for a targeted panel? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, Can you repeat it? Uh, is it possible to do it for a targeted panel? Um, I think you really do need uh, probes or, um, or, or regions that out on, on, the, on the borders to be able to calibrate exactly what's going on. It's not, it's not ideal, and I think people have done different ad hoc solutions for that and, and are, are reporting reliable results. Um, the, the problem there is that, let's say you see a very low signal in a particular locus. If it's, if it's a PCR-based panel, you, you don't really know if it's because PCR just didn't work in that assay or whether there's actually a deletion there um, without having the flanking parts of the genome to, to be able to look at that. So it's a tricky question, I think. the. Um, a lot of people will tell you, especially the people that are selling panels, that yes, <laughs> you can find copy number variations using our panel, and um, and and often it's probably true, uh, but but there are some major caveats with that. Which you specific people do commercial the, the panel? Yeah. Like yeah, but, but but still with all those caveats here. Yeah, I, definitely. You still need a normal sample with a panel, and you normalize all the signals using this normal sample. Um, so, yeah, okay. So, it depends what what the panel is designed to do. So, if you're looking for, for example, mutational hotspots, which we'll talk about this afternoon, um, if you have a KRAS codon 12 mutation, you don't need a normal to say that that's going to be important. In fact, I mean, that that's and, and often you're working with paraffin embedded tissues, and you don't have normal anyway. If it's in clinical context, um, often you just don't have blood to work with in a, in a clinical assay. 
Um, if you want to just so with a with a panel, a clinical panel, you really want to be able to minim, minimally affect the normal workflow of of looking at a tumor specimen. And so, uh, in pathology, you, there's there's a formalin fix biopsy, and that should be the material that one work, works with. In the vast majority of cases, it will not be a blood draw uh, available to um, in, in to do that type of work. So. So for, for panels, especially hotspot mutations, BRAF V600E, KRAS codon 12, PI3 kinase, 1047, et cetera, um, it's sufficient to have the tumor because that mutation is interpretable. If that mutation was in the germline, the person wouldn't be a person, I don't think. So. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so now the bottom plot, right? So. So the, the, the other important aspect of this is, of course, we do have these two copies of our, of our genome. And this is a nice example because it shows um, a couple of, of patterns. So what's plotted on the, um, on the y-axis here is um, each one of these dots is a, uh, a SNP. It's a heterozygous SNP that's called in the normal sample here. So the workflow here is that you first take the normal sample and you call um, all of the heterozygous polymorphisms in the normal sample. And then we can actually look at what happens in the tumor. So what's plotted here is that those same loci, we plot um, the allele ratio of uh, those two alleles, because we, we, we know that the heterozygous, we, and we <laughs> collapse that down to whether reads match the reference or not. And we count that in the tumor. So we count what proportion of reads um, are matching the reference. And for regions that have maintained heterozygosity in the tumor, uh, that should center somewhere around 0.5. Okay? So, so half the reads should show um, uh, uh, the variant here. And, and so that's this region here. You can see this is a diploid region. Uh, and the allele ratio here is, is centered around 0.5. There's some noise in the system, but it's essentially that. Then let's look at this, um, this green region here. This is a deletion. And you can see that that has shifted the pattern away from uh, heterozygosity. So, um, so now we have either uh, one, one allele or the other, okay? So, and you see this, um, this pattern. This is often called the B allele frequency or the allele ratio. Um, it's called the B allele frequency in SNP6 because in, in, in SNP6, it's designed with um, probing the major and minor allele, um, and that's often called A and B. And so uh, this is just looking at, it, it, this would be called the minor allele frequency in, uh, in SNP6 data. And so, so this is really quite important because um, you can imagine if you had a mutation in in the, in one of the alleles, and then uh, this deletion is actually removing the wild type allele, then that mutation becomes homozygous, and the only thing that's left in that cell is the mutant allele, and so that's often a very very good clue, especially if you have uh, truncating stop codon mutations or you have frame shifting insertions and deletions. Um, that is a very good clue. That's a tumor suppressor gene. Um, almost all the tumor suppressors have this type of pattern, especially p53, where you have a, a loss of function mutation. And we'll get into that in this, in this afternoon. Uh, that then is followed by or accompanied by um, a loss of the wild type allele. Okay, so that that's what this pattern looks like. So if you delete one copy, then you get something like this. Then um, what's shown here is, is who can, um, what's happening in this region here? Can anybody take a guess? Yeah. Yeah, so, so what's the sequence of events here? No, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> Right, right. Okay, so so you probably had a you probably had this whole chromosome arm loss, and the, and then and then it was followed by a duplication of this this part of the chromosome here, and so what, what's qu quite interesting is that you see that that results in even a further split, 
And that's because essentially there are more reads here because there's more material there, and so you get a better signal. And, um, and so, so we call that copy neutral loss of header zygosity, um, or some more technical terms are uni parental disomy, or you can imagine, there are a number of different terms for this, but copy neutral loss of header, header zygosity is, is a reasonable way. So, so what's important about this is that you can see that here you have a diploid region, it's blue, it's right on the zero line, but it's maintained its heterozygosity. Whereas here, you have a diploid region and it's homozygous. So these have very different consequences if you had a mutation in, in those, dif those two different regions. Okay. Can you use this type of thing to calculate a purity? Mm. That's a great question. Yes, you can indeed. So, all right. So, I wasn't going to get into that until later, but I might as well talk about it now. Um, the... So the degree of spread here, so you can imagine that, so why do we still, if it's, if it's actually homozygous, and it's homozygous in all cells, all tumor cells, then why do we still see data points down here? So that's often because of normal contamination, or this could be due to stroma, or inf infiltrating lymphocytes, that are still, of course, non-malignant cells. They don't have those. These are cells that don't have these changes, but they're admixed with um, with the population of cells from which we do the DNA extraction. So when you do the DNA extraction, it's a soup of <laughs> DNA that is contributed from many different sources of cells. We'll really and we'll really get into the details of that this afternoon. But um, but as a, by way of introduction, so this is why we don't see data points right at the, the extremes. And, and the degree of shift away from heterozygosity is often a clue of how many cells harbor that particular abnormality and is proportion, proportional to, those, to, the, to, the, to the number of cells that harbor that abnormality. So if you have contaminating normal cells, it will actually um, dampen that signal uh, in, in predictable ways. And so that one can actually infer um, the, the proportion of normal cells in the sample. So it's often highly beneficial to have um, a pathologist review the material prior to sequencing, because often you can have um, materials that are so contaminated that you may see you may not see any signal at all, and um, that's happened. Typically, happens even even with pathologist review, it can still happen because sometimes you're not always looking at exactly the same material, and um, but. This, these are expensive assays, and so you want to make sure that when you do a DNA extraction, you're actually sequencing um, tumor cells and not just normal cells. Yes. So we are seeing uh, in the whole genome, we are seeing two parts. One is homozygous deletion, one is homozygous duplication. But in the SNP array, the, in, in the homozygous duplication, I don't see anything. And in the homozygous deletion, it, the pattern looks like duplication. If you look at the light green one I'm seeing there. This is the same data. This is this is this yes. is the same as this is both from whole genome sequencing. There's no SNP array here. It, it, this is derived both from whole genome sequencing. Except we, we use the SNPs in the bottom here to infer something about whether it's ha the locus is heterozygous or homozygous. So, so why we are not seeing the homozygous duplication in the blue part of the alteration? Um, so this is, can be considered, are you talking about the difference between the top and the bottom? Um, there, there is one dot at the right in the part that we are, uh, there are two blue parts. The one on the right has yeah. one homozygous duplication point. This one? Yes. Okay. Do you see the homozygous duplication? So, uh, so I would, Homozygous duplication. Okay, so the, the way I would think about this is that first there's a deletion of this entire region from here yeah. all the way to the telomere. Then there's a second event that um, results in a duplication of just the, from this material to this material here. And so... And there is one region there which is red. Ah, this. Is this yeah, what you're talking about? about ah, okay. So we don't know when that happened. <laughs> Um, uh, we can start to try to trace it uh, with uh, various different techniques, but um, that could very well have happened at, in the as a third event. 
but I'm asking why I'm not seeing it in the uh, data from the SNPs. Ah, okay. Okay. Well, if you look very, very carefully, um, in fact, you, if you just line it up, you can see that there's even a greater shift towards the um, towards the, the top and bottom that corresponds with that red amplification. The one which is shown with green? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, okay, so it's green because it's, it's the algorithm that's predicted that that's actually um, likely to be um, homozygous, but it's, called, it's amplified homozygous, whereas the blue is neutral, copy neutral homozygous. Yeah. And one more thing you're mm -hmm. saying, saying that uh, this allele ratio is the same as the allele frequency. It's analogous to that, yeah. It's analogous, but it's not the same. So this here is the ratio of minor to uh, major, but the other one is no. only the minor. So in, in sequencing data, we, yeah, okay. In sequencing data, we're, we typically um, look at SNPs in terms of um, reference versus alternate. So, because we align all the reads to the reference. So, in sequencing data, it's typically relative to the, to the reference. Whereas in the SNP design, the major and minor are classed as, um, uh, as, popu as population-based alleles. So, so the, the reason that those probes were, were chosen in the first place is because they have some sort of um, frequency in the human population. And that's where major and minor. So A and B are the major and minor. And whereas uh, in sequencing data, it's reference and alternate. OK? OK, so I think we're, we're still OK. Michelle, OK, it's all right. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we have until 10.30. It's all good. Um, all right, so let's just look into what genes are known to be affected by, uh, by these alterations. We have um, the, the, the classical um, genes that are associated with high-level amplifications, ERB2 in breast cancer, EGFR in, uh, in, in, in lung cancers, and also brain cancers. Um, MYC is associated with um, many different malignancies, including lymphomas, um, PI3 kinase in breast cancer, and the list goes on, CDK4, CDK6. Uh, as well. And then deletions are uh, a collection of, of, of the well-known tumor suppressor genes. Um, so there's the retinoblastoma protein, P10, CDKN2A slash B, um, MAP2K4, NF1, um, et cetera, et cetera. So these, these are genes that might be typically associated with um, homozygous deletion. And, and there's actually a, a, a really uh, an incredible amount of literature that's been generated in the last five years uh, on High resolution views of uh, of large collections of tumors, and this is just a, a small sampling of, of that those papers. But um, if you really want to educate yourself in terms of um, somatic copy number changes in cancer, uh, read at least these papers, and 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 maybe um, and that will give you a, a good overview of of the landscape. Okay, so. This is work that um, I'll present now that uh, describes the genomic and transcri transcriptomic architecture of 2,000 breast cancers. This is work I did um, in collaboration with Sam Aparicio at the BC Cancer Agency and also Carlos Caldas uh, in Cambridge, where we collected this uh, set of 2,000 breast tumors. And, and to date, it's still actually the largest um, exploration of copy number landscapes in the literature uh, came out um, a couple years ago. So uh, the TCGA study set was about um, 600 cases, and 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 so uh, this is um, uh, this came out before the TCGA and still is is the largest collection. So I showed you uh, I showed you a while ago very beginning, uh, the frequency of alterations in the, in the patient population. And you can think back to that and, and you remember that almost the whole genome was affected in some way. And then we talked about how copy number changes affect the gene expression measurements um, from, the same, from the same tumor. And so when we overlay gene expression, 
uh, onto that landscape, we actually get a much sharper view of, uh, of where the hotspots or the important regions of the genome um, are. And so what's shown here is where you have high-level amplifications or homozygous deletions, which I've already introduced, that have a, uh, essentially a concomitant uh, change in expression. And, and so we identified a number of loci across the genome. Um, for example, here you have um, cyclin D1. And this is known, but right next to it, uh, very close by, it's actually a separate and distinct amplicon on the 11Q13 locus, and I'll, I'll get back to why that was important to, um, to identify. And the genes in that locus are PAC1, RSF1, and, and S4. And, and then, um, so we see a number of these regions, and, and a lot of these um, loci were already determined. So here's RB2. This is the boss locus. You can see that this, the, this, is, um, this is the locus in the genome that, um, that is, is most frequently uh, has the most frequent high-level amplifications and association with, uh, with expression. And, um, but, but we also see, for example, uh, cyclin E1 uh, and, uh, and, and these other loci um, spread throughout AIM1, for example. And these were new regions to study uh, in the breast cancer landscape. So, by overlaying expression, one gets an interpretive advantage because um, if we were to look at that plot that I showed at the very beginning, we'd have to study the whole genome <laughs> uh, to, to really tease out what's likely to be driving these cancers. But when you start to overlay expression, it gets reduced um, dramatically into, um, into sort of a manageable number of regions. And we have now ongoing research um, that that's stemmed from this where uh, we're trying to mechanistically identify um, uh, many of these targets as, as, as pathogenic drivers. And in fact, we've already published a paper on, on ZNF703 as a result of this work, and that's um, now confirmed as, um, as, a, as, a, as a driver gene in breast cancer. So the other uh, important result from this paper is that um, we used copy number profiles to stratify the population. So uh, at the time when we started this work, um, breast cancer essentially was divided into five different uh, gene expression-based subtypes. So, and, and really in practice, we still have three clinical subtypes of breast cancer. Um, and, uh, and so the, the gene expression work from uh, the late 90s and, and early 2000s has, has yielded uh, a little bit more resolution in terms of five different subtypes. But we wanted to analyze a large series in great detail because um, even though there are these nice classifiers that existed, there's massive heterogeneity in response to treatment in, within each of these classes. And so we try to explain, try to explain this heterogeneity with uh, a much higher resolution classification. So this is a quite a complicated slide, but um, just to show that uh, Remember the population level um, plots that I showed you at the beginning? Well, this is now uh, uh, a representation of that population, but broken into 10 different uh, subgroups, which we uh, actually found in an unsupervised clustering approach. So we took the copy number profiles and, ge and gene expression profiles and, uh, and then clustered the data according to, um, to those markers. And we reproducibly uh, found that um, these, the population can be split into about 10 different groups according to both the copy number profile and expression profiles. And so here's the discovery set of the first thousand cases. And then we validated that in a secondary set of another thousand cases uh, using the same approach. And so you can see that there are really these reproducible patterns. So um, the patterns of note that I want, that I'll want to point out are, so here's, here's the, the RB2 locus. And what's shown on the, in the black here is what is the subtype specificity of that particular um, region? And so when you see a, a high black line, that suggests that that locus is only affected in that subgroup. And so uh, this is essentially characterized almost uniquely by amplification of RB2. Uh, and then we see uh, another group, this group 2 down here, which is characterized by an amplification on 11Q13. And I'll talk about the significance of that in a minute. 
Um, and, uh, and so each of these groups have distinct copy number profiles. And so one can ask, well, okay, well, what's the, so what? Who cares? Um, uh, and, and so the, the really important part of this study is that we were very careful to collect tumors um, that had at least 10 years follow -up, clinical follow-up um, in different registries. So we, we were able to, we actually had the outcome data from all 2,000 cases. And, and to, to get to 2,000, we actually had to um, look at tumors from five different centers uh, in the UK and, and in Canada. And so we were able to, to uh, project what the outcome distributions of uh, these different groups were. And a lot of these tumors, interestingly enough, were collected uh, in the pre-Herceptin era. So these are quite old uh, samples that we're able to, to collect. So it's quite rare to have these frozen samples. You can do affine metric SNP6, gene expression data, uh, and with clinical outcomes. And so, um, so is everyone familiar with um, Kaplan-Meier plots? Anybody not familiar? Okay. We're okay with that? We're going to look at this Friday? Okay, well, uh, essentially what uh, it shows is, is over time what the proportion of, um, of surviving patients is and, uh, in each group. And you can see here that uh, this pink group here uh, it has, has a pretty decent uh, uh, outcome spectrum. So over, over time, after five years, um, about 80% of the population is still alive. Um, and whereas in in this group here, this, these, these are the really bad actors here, um, and this is actually the HER2 uh, amplified group. So remember, it's pre-Herceptin. Um, this is uh, only 40% of, case, of cases we've been alive after five years of diagnosis. So if we were to do this today, um, that brown curve would very likely be closer to the top, um, and it would be more like in the 70-75% 70, range. Yeah? So, okay, so the triple negatives are, um, are I think it's group 10, um, these purple ones here. Yeah, these are the basils here. So, of note is this, uh, this, this group 2 here. Uh, I just wanted to point this out. So, so this group 2 is, is actually composed uh, entirely of ER-positive cancers. And in breast cancer, uh, the estrogen receptor positive cases um, tend to respond very well to hormone-based therapy. And so the outcomes uh, for these patients is typically very, very good. And so this pink group is, is, is also predominantly ER positive. Um, but you can see here that there's a subset of patients, and it's only 5% of the population, uh, it has very, very poor outcome and almost as bad after five years as the her to treatment naive group, um, and so uh, so this this is actually quite important. If we go back to this group here, this is the group down here. Um, we would not have found this uh, without first first of all high resolution technology, and and second of all a large series of cases, um, and so because it's only five percent of the population. But this represents, a, a, I think, a real op uh, opportunity now for to develop a therapeutic against that 11Q13 ampl amplicon because, um, because it's, it is a high-level amplification. It's very much like the HER2 locus. And, and the genes in there are probably really good targets to start developing inhibitors against because they have overexpression. And, and you know, hopefully, uh, in 10 years' time, we can look at this curve and, and maybe push it up further towards where these pink guys are. So, uh, so this is where um, I think high resolution uh, examination of genomes and transcriptomes together really has great power in identifying um, a, a particular phenotypes in a large series of, of cases. And, and so the, the, the N here um, is, is really quite important. So 2,000 cases, not easy to come by. It's the largest collection in the world, but, but it illustrates the power of, uh, of doing this work on a large scale. So uh, the major conclusions here is essentially that there are, are uh, that these recurrent copy number profiles can be used to stratify patients and, to, um, and identify novel molecular subgroups. And you can see this coming out in the TCGA and other large-scale studies like the ICGC will, will undoubtedly reveal this as well. Um, the, the subgroups were clinically meaningful in Metabric since they co-segregated with these prognostic profiles. And, um, and then just to illustrate that um, typically driver alterations will be focal and, um, uh, and low amplitude uh, 
or low F2. Okay, so maybe this is a good time for a pause. Any other questions? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the so one way to do it is by you can imagine that uh, tumor suppressor genes will be uh, affected in a number of different ways. So, so this is uh, tumor suppressor gene that will often be lost. The protein will be lost. And that's what leads to malignancy. And so you can imagine that um, there, if you were to change the genome, you can lose a protein in, in, in numerous different ways. You can have mutations, stop codon mutations, frame shifting insertions and deletions um, that result in um, either degradation of protein or the protein never gets made due to transcripts being sent to nonsense mediated decay. Um, and then those can also be accompanied by homozygous deletions. Or um, uh, and or uh, deletions of one copy that render that mutation homozygous. So, so that's an opportunity right there. So you can, uh, you can imagine that there's a profile of a tumor suppressor that has um, copy number changes of a certain kind, focal homozygous deletions, loss of heterozygosity accompanied by um, loss of function mutations, and then mutations spread throughout the gene, because it doesn't matter where you have a stop codon mutation, just as long as there is one before the end, the, the end of the protein. So we'll talk a little bit about that pattern in, this, in the afternoon. So that's, that's one way. And then the other is that you can imagine that, um, again, you can reduce the whole um, copy number landscape into these focal changes. So, so it's very difficult to interpret a chromosome arm level gain of one copy. That's really hard because you've got thousands of genes in there. But if you see a high level amplification of just two or three genes that's in the 20, 30, 40 copy number, copy number range, that's a really, really good indication that that's going to be important. So, so those genes could be put into a gene set um, that, is, uh, that, that is also accompanied by mutation lists. Um, and I think you're going to really explore that on. Um, Thursday, I believe, where you have gene tomorrow, we have gene sets to work with, and and then you try to understand is there some sort of biological pattern that's associated with those genes. So, so pathway analysis is a really nice way to integrate um, multiple molecular views of a, a particular data set. Okay. Yeah. So you were saying before that uh, we either see a pattern of uh, single nucleotide variation, or you see um, uh, copy number alteration. It's unusual to see both. Yes. Um, so, what what I was referring to is, is lo so um, you will often see both um, events in a tumor, but the tumor type will typically associate with large scale changes in copy number changes, or uh, uh, lots of mutate or mu point mutation driven type of events. But you rarely see. Um, a tumor type in aggregate. So when you see, when you're actually looking at populations, that will associate with both, because it, it's it's it would be probably deleterious to the cell to have two types of DNA repair mechanisms that are that are aberrated. So if the DNA repair mechanism that's compromised in uh, copy number alterations is the combination. Often is that's the case. Yeah. Are there different uh, layers? Uh, for focal amplifications versus large-scale amplifications? Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, so um, certainly the BRCA cases are have this genomic disruption associated with some massive amounts of rearrangement, um, large-scale copy number changes. The um, the focal changes uh, can can arise through um, many different ways, and, and one of the ways is through break fusion bridge cycles, and uh, where we have this really, uh, um, this cyclical pattern of um, telomeric loss that leads to um, different ways in which the same locus can then get duplicated and stitched together. And so it creates this kind of um, very complex 
structure that, that but it manifests itself on these readouts as these, these kind of, when you have many, many copies of a locus. And, and often these focal amplifications are driven through these brain confusion bridge cycles. It's not known exactly um, how, what the real mechanism for that is. Why is that allowed to occur? This is just because of lack of uh, double strand break uh, repair uh, leads to that kind of stochastically in a way. Um, and I'm not, not sure how to, um, to, to really attribute that to a, to a mechanism. But, um, but certainly, so what's interesting to think about is that um, the new class of drugs called PARP inhibitors, for example, that target um, cells with homologous recombination deficiency actually operate to inhibit the other DNA repair pathway. So an, a, a different, a complementary DNA repair pathway that operate, uh, operates on single strand breaks. So, so that's like a single, uh, it's, a, it's a synthetic lethal type of approach where you already have, the cancer cells have this one vulnerability and, and then, then the, the drug actually then um, creates a new vulnerability and, and, and then the cells can't cope. So, so if you think about from that perspective, not, evolution would not select for you know, both things to operate because the cells have no capacity to, to, assist, to keep any kind of genomic integrity after that. Okay, okay. Okay, so let's let's move on. We, we should we should push this here. Okay, um, let's check it. Do a time check. Good. Ten o'clock. All right. So um, so I just want to spend a bit of time on genotypes and um, and what that means. So so this is just a very basic table that shows um, when we have, for example. Um, the most basic genotype that we should always expect is, is AB, and AB meaning that um, there's one allele from that's maternal, one allele that's paternal, and again that can have different contexts depending on the platform. So, um, so SNP6 array that will be major minor, and in the sequencing data that will be ref non ref, uh, and and you can imagine that has a zygosity status, if you will, of of, heterozyg of heterozygous. But then you can have two copies that are um, that are both that are BB and that, that would be LOH, and then that pattern continues as you have more and more copy number states. So here's a copy number um, where you have three copies that yields uh, four different possible genotypes because you can have um, three copies of just the A allele, you can have two and one, and one and two, and then three of the B allele. Um, and so, uh, so this is an important concept because the, the pattern of spread of the B allele actually corresponds to these different um, discrete genotypes. And a lot of the algorithms um, take, this into, uh, t take this into account when segmenting the data. So, uh, so uh, this, this is an important concept to, to, to carry forward um, as we look at the data. So this is just an example. I've gone over this already, so I won't spend too much time on this. But, um, but this, um, this work was um, one of the first uh, examples of how to process uh, sequencing data to um, to infer loss of heterozygosity. So, so here uh, here's a deletion again that um, has a, results in the spread of the the B alleles. This region here, this amplification, this also has a spread of the B alleles. It's not tightly centered around uh, 0.5, but um, but the inference here is that actually both alleles are still present but it's just been skewed away because the amplification is probably just amplifying one allele. So if we go back to this, we'll probably have a situation like this where we have A, 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 B. Um, and, and so that's a very different um, uh, inference than, for example, here where you have um, only one allele is present. So to be able to distinguish these, these is very important. And to, know, to, to do that, you can do, think about simultaneous analysis of these B alleles and the, and the copy number. And that's what most of the um, uh, approaches that are out there now uh, actually do. And so um, actually, Andrew, uh, what, what, are you going to use OncoSNP in the lab? Or what's, yeah, OncoSNP. So OncoSNP is an algorithm that um, simultaneously infers uh, the copy number and uh, and the loss of heterozygosity pattern. So the output is actually not just copy number here, but it's actually the genotype at each locus. Okay. 
Any questions on that? Okay. Yeah. So this is this is also from sequencing data, but it's very it's analogous in SNP6 data. It's the same. You, know, so you see the same picture. Um, okay. So so the studying alleles is actually quite important because um, of the notion of haploinsufficiency. So um, so often uh, a phenotype can be induced with just a single copy loss of a particular protein, um, and that that's um, that's borne out in um, in, in, for example, p53 levels, whereas in, in other cases uh, you can have uh, it's really important it's it's required to have two hits uh, of a particular locus to to induce the phenotype. So the classic example is 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 the RB locus, retinoblastoma locus, which is discovered by um, by studying actually rare um, the rare incidence of, of, of retinoblastoma in certain families. And, uh, and so there's a strong suggestion that there's a genetic component to this. And, uh, but it was, wasn't, the mechanism wasn't revealed until looking at the somatic genetics, whereby um, there's a mutation in one copy um, in, that's in the germline, and that's inherited. Uh, and then some cells, uh, somewhere along in development of these children, um, uh, resulted in a in a secondary loss uh, of the wild type of, of the wild type allele, and so it wasn't until we get that secondary loss that the malignant phenotype is is induced, and so that's called the classic Knudsen two hit hypothesis, and um, and there's a um, a couple of classic papers you can read on on that, um, and then so, so then there's this this uh, notion of of quasi sufficiency where just small changes in uh, in the number of copies. Um, start to induce um, in, induce phenotype, um, and and in, in even gets more complicated in that in that some cases um, mutations, for example, actually need to be heterozygous to to operate. Um, so it's, it becomes a cooperation between the mutant allele and the and the wild type allele in order for um, for that to be borne out. And 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 an example of this is is the EZH2. Uh, Y641 mutation in uh, lymphomas, where uh, it operates by um, essentially cooperating. It's a mutant allele operates by cooperating with a wild type allele. And this was a, actually a mutation that was discovered in our center uh, a few years ago. Okay. So let's look at measurement technologies. And they're going to be mostly conceptual here because you're actually going to look at this in the lab. But um, we talked a little bit about resolution. So um, the lowest resolution technology for looking at copy number changes is, is of course, fluorescence in situ, in situ hybridization. I guess one could actually say that um, those spectral karyograms are really the lowest resolution of them all. Um, but, but then we can start to look at um, around uh, 100 KB. Um, and, and, and there are fish probes. Actually, you can do 16 color, multicolor fish now uh, fairly reliably. So you can look at 16 loci across the genome um, uh, in the same assay. Um, and then in the early 2000s, uh, we started to see the emergence of, um, of taking this concept of looking at multi-probes and, and, and actually being able to, um, to t scale that to look at um, a 30,000, uh, started with 10,000 and then 30,000 probes across the genome and uh, using arrays, uh, uh, comparative genomic hybridization. Then we saw the emergence of genotype arrays um, really actually designed for studying variation in the normal human population, but it became apparent that there are going to be very powerful technologies to study cancers as well, and so they were widely adopted by the cancer community. And in fact, I think um, Affymetrix has probably um, uh, benefited from, uh, from projects like the TCGA much more so than, than the original design, which is for, for the Thousand Genomes Project and others, uh, uh, map type projects. Um, and, then, and then finally we get to um, 3G resolution, as I like to call it, uh, which is um, whole genome sequencing uh, at nucleotide resolution. So, so this is the kind of history, I guess, that spans several decades. And, um, and, and really, we pick up here about 10 years ago. So all this stuff is fairly new. Uh, we really haven't had the capacity to measure copy number changes at high resolution across the genome uh, for very long at all. 
and uh, and so uh, it's it's quite exciting because it opens up a whole new um, opportunity for research. So let's just look at how genotyping uh, arrays work. And this is very schematic. Okay, so this is not um, this is not from Affymetrics itself. This is just uh, a schematic to illustrate the point. So the first thing we do is is you can design probes where uh, uh, these are typically designed so that um, there's unambiguous uh, sequence in the genome. So you have specificity of hybridization. We minimize cross hybridization or off target hybridization to that to that region. Um, and and with back arrays, they're typically 100 kb probes. So so the specificity is you know usually pretty good. The Illumina, uh, sorry, the Affymetrix SNP6 arrays are, are 25 MERS, uh, but they did a lot of engineering work to make sure that, that, that those 25 MERS were highly specific, although, you know, it's not perfect, but, but, um, but the, they managed to, to do this with 25 MERS. So, so here's the array, and then uh, you put this on a glass slide or any kind of slide, and we know in the array coordinates uh, where on the genome those probes come from. Okay, so the readout, then we can plot the readout uh, according to the chromosomal position. And, and again, this, this, these dots are proportional to uh, the hybridization intensity, um, and that's, uh, that's read off of a digital, by digital um, photography and then, uh, and then image processing to get something like this. So we go from uh, hybridization intensities through image processing to a readout that looks something like this. And if you zoom in on this, you can see that just these probes here um, have a, a lower uh, intensity, and so uh, it, what, then we try to infer that this is probably a segmental deletion. Yes. Um, so so this is these are arrays. So this is just DNA extraction, and um, and then I actually not. This is back. These are back arrays that I'm, that I'm showing here. Um, I'm actually not sure. I'm not sure about that. Um, but it's the, for Affymetrix. It's a standard kit. I mean, just it's really, really easy. Y yeah. So there's an SOP that you just follow. Um, and it's standard and 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 almost you know with a box um, that almost any lab. I mean, the, these these boxes are distributed. Everywhere. I mean, they're they're really straightforward to use. Um, okay, and then so each data point here then represents, um, an, in loose terms, uh, the copy number of a particular clone or probe um, relative to the reference. And that reference can be a norm, a match normal, or a pooled reference, as I as I discussed earlier. So uh, the difference then for um, high density genotyping arrays is that uh, for SNP six. Uh, we have measurement of two alleles at um, approximately, uh, actually it's not true, at more than a million. So it's 900,000 uh, of the probes, of the 1.8 million probes, are SNP, are SNP based. So they have actually two different 25 MERS that differ at one, one nucleotide. And that's probing the major minor alleles in the population. Um, and that's that's actually a key distinction between the SNP genotyping arrays and uh, and and the array situation. I've already shown you what the power of that is and how why that's important. But of me because measuring alleles really gives you interpretive capacity of what those copy number changes are doing um, to to the um, to the heterozygosity profile. Okay, good. So now we're going to get into uh, some of the topics around uh, statistical inference and. Um, the topic has already come up about normal contamination. So even though a lot of these platforms, uh, whole genome sequencing, SNP6 arrays, et cetera, are actually designed with normal uh, genomes in mind. And so uh, it took a long time for the computational community and statistics community to catch up with the fact that, in fact, when you study a cancer population, there are many different properties of the cancer genomes that are not taken to, into account when studying a normal genome. So the major concepts are the fact that we have a normal contamination, so we have an admixture of uh, stromal lymphocytic cells um, with an epithelial um, uh, component as well. And, and that also, uh, we have intratumoral 
heterogeneity. So I've done a lot of work in this area where we've um, been able to start to um, measure and model the clonal populations of cells with, it, with different genomes. And we'll talk a more about that this afternoon. Um, but, um, and, and so most experimental designs, uh, so there are two, two aspects of this. One is that you have heterogene heterogeneous populations within a single sample where maybe only a minor population might harbor a particular deletion. And so the sensitivity of that um, is, is, is directly proportional to the, the number of cells which actually harbor that, that change in the first place. And the second is that um, if we to look at uh, spatially separated um, deposits, met metastases, for example, we might find actually quite different results. So, uh, so the, the tumors will likely be clonally related, but, but there may be in one, uh, just due to mi microenvironmental selective pressures, uh, uh, there may be in one sample uh, a set of ab abnormalities that don't exist in the other sample at all. So subject to, um, to spatial sampling bias as well. Um, so that's something to take in mind. Um, so then we have the issue of ploidy. So uh, ploidy is, uh, so endoreduplication that induces tetraploidy, for example, or even octoploidy is, is, a common, uh, is a common occurrence in tumors. So sometimes we have, um, uh, in ovarian cancer, probably at least half cases, half the cases at the time of diagnosis are tetraploid. We've got four copies of their genomes have undergone some whole genome reduplication. So that has some bearing on how we interpret alleles as well. Okay, and so, uh, you know, up until a couple of years ago, the, the, the fact, there were basically no tools available to, to take all these factors into account. It's really been an explosion of activity in the last three, four years. And, um, and so, uh, you know, make, just make the point that um, taking off-the-shelf tools that are designed for normal genomes is not going to work very well. And, um, and so specialized tools for cancer are, are really needed. And, that, and that's what this, you know, this workshop is here to, to expose you to some of those tools. Uh, and you'll have some practice with them in the lab this afternoon. So here's a very nice overview of these concepts um, from Terry Speed's uh, group. And, um, uh, and he talks about how uh, the statistical analysis of, of these SNP arrays in, uh, in cancer studies um, and how to deal with a lot of these different phenomena. So in general, uh, we have a workflow that looks something like this, where uh, from the data generation that's just straight from the machine, this is for SNP6 analysis, we get um, something called a cell file. And, um, and you'll be starting from a cell file in the lab. And uh, I believe so, um, and then and then going from from there, and so we do um, a, a couple of really important steps. So there's some pre-processing and normalization. Anytime you do an array, um, there's some uh, there's some aspects that um, often need to be cleaned up, and, and the same same is true of, of whole genome sequencing as well. So we have to go through some level of pre-processing and normalization, and we do. Um, the total copy number extraction from there, and then the B allele extraction. So now we're dealing with these SNP6 arrays. We're going to infer these two different quantities. And then we're going to learn how to take that raw data and then look for breakpoints and for the copy number changes, um, segment uh, into loss of heterozygosity and allele specific copy number changes. And then uh, ultimately, we do some sort of gene and pathway analysis and or a clinical correlation. So, so this would be the example, um, for example, a workflow that we applied to the Metabrix study. Okay. Uh, so just some detailed specifications about SNP-6. So I said there are 25 mer oligonucleotide probes, 900,000 SNP probes, 900,000 CNV probes, um, and... Uh, and so there are a number of tools that have been developed for pre-processing. Um, the, uh, the, the, the tool that we like to use is, uh, is called Aroma. Uh, there are other very nice ones called Pen C and B, for example. Um, do, Andrew, what's going to be discussed in the lab? Which, which one? Okay. So, okay, good. So, so we'll talk about Pen C and B in the lab, and then... Um, uh, and, and both of these methods will output allele-specific and total copy real-value data. 
And so just, just by illustration uh, for affymetrics, the aroma.affymetrix package, um, this is just a histogram of the intensities um, across the genome for, I think, 10 different samples here. And you can see that they're quite, they're quite variable and so not comparable to each other. And these are just normal samples. Um, but then after normalization, we get a much more comparable set. So, um, so th this is very analogous to gene expression microarray normalization, uh, which I think you're going to cover as well. So the important concept here is that there needs to be an adjustment of the data so that the, they're comparable to each other, and we remove the possibility of batch effects or um, something th um, that's specific to a run. Okay, uh, and then and then we have these um, different features. Okay, so now I'm going to throw in some notation. So this is just something that you may um, some scare some people, but don't be scared of it. Um, it's just uh, these are just help to unambiguously define what we're talking about. So, um, so we have intensity for a particular allele at a position, um, A and B, and that can just be denoted by Y. And then the, the total intensity uh, is just the sum of these two alleles. And then, uh, and then you have, uh, for example, the total copy number at a given position. Okay, so it's just um, YJ over the, over the reference. And there can be some um, standard um, normalization constant here, this gamma here. Uh, and then the B allele fraction is, of course, just the intensity of, of the B uh, over, the, over the total. Okay, so, so these are the types of things that you might, if you really want to dig into this, that these are the types of notation that you might see. Um, and then, uh, so, so then we go from uh, signal processing um, to, to actual copy numbers. So, so what's shown here, really, if now we think about notation, is um, this is the Y, or the total copy number, um, at each locus. And, and then we try to take, and of course, you know, they're not colored. And, um, and we try to take these um, black dots and put colors on them by segmenting the data into con these contiguous blocks and uh, into different states. So we project the continuous data onto discrete values. And here, uh, this, this question came up earlier about um, normal CNV. So, so here's an advantage of having a match normal. So uh, this is a, a signal that is very focal. Uh, it looks like it's low amplitude, and so it has the, all the hallmarks of what you think would be a tumor suppressor gene. And so, oh, there's a homozygous deletion here. So I'm going to look at what that gene is, and then I'm going to do all kinds of functional assays and create mouse models and then write a cell paper. But, but actually, uh, this is in the germline, and, um, and so it's probably not affecting um, the, the malignancy at all. Uh, so, so this is where having... Um, uh, the advantage of, of a match normal will be very, very good. Uh, we've been developing algorithms, um, and this is work from Gavin Ha in, in my lab, where if you didn't have the match normal, um, could one actually recognize this signal as being a germline? And in fact, um, uh, this analysis uh, has, has shown um, just that. So, uh, so he's developed a method whereby, just from a tumor sample, um, one can use the statistical properties that one would expect from normal germline CNVs um, to try to uh, classify these events as being germline and not somatic. Okay. Yeah? So is this a germline CNV or is it a haplotype of minor allele snakes? So, so this, would be, this would be probably, um, there are two possible ways that something like this could happen. So you, the, reference, the, the reference human genome actually turns out to be um, predominantly from, I think, an African-American Afri individual. Um, and it just happened that I think there are five DNA samples in the original Human Genome Project. And, and this person's genome um, just made for a really nice library. <laughs> and so it ended up getting used uh, disproportionately to, to everyone else. And so the reference human genome could very well have tandem duplications at this locus, but, um, but uh, it, 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 that could be almost specific to that individual. So most of us probably don't have that tandem duplication, so it manifests as a deletion in, when we look at it. So that's, that's likely what's going on here. Yeah? Um, if you like to use slides with so you have this when you're calculating copy number, you have this reference. So yeah. when you talk about reference there, are you talking about 
like a match normal reference? It just has to be a reference of, say, like, pool normal yeah. like done at the same time. So it's interchangeable, right? So, so in, it, a match reference is best, but often you don't. So, so then you can replace that with just a pool with a pooled reference. Okay. So you yeah. think you get a lot of benefit from having it? Yeah, definitely. I mean, if you so, just look at this is a, this is why I put this example here. Yeah, because if if you just to look at this tumor example, and, and you know we've we've done we've done some algorithmic development there, and 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 the algorithm is is generally good. But, but it's not perfect. And so the best way to, to rule out a germline polymorphism is by having the norm, normal layer in the first place. OK. So um, I think I've talked. I'm going to skip over this. Skip over this. OK. So there are a, a number of approaches that have appeared in the literature, and they range from um, uh, smoothing type models, where we try to actually fit uh, a spline type curve through the data. Um, that's probably not recommended, because um, ultimately, you to go from a continuous value measurement to then you end up with a continuous value measurement, and you still have to then interpret that. Um, and then we have uh, segmentation approaches that, that try to um, infer where there might be a change in level. Um, and, and so this has been a very, very popular approach is to, um, to segment the data or to, to just uh, determine where the breaks are in the genome. That has some disadvantages in the sense that uh, we still have then, we have these segments, and those segments are continuous value measurements as well. So you still have to then um, post-process that data to then classify those segments into new copy ne neutral gain, loss, etc. Um, uh, there have been some suggestions of, um, of uh, models that treat each data point independently. And, and that has some, uh, that's really not desirable because we know that these, um, these events actually span multiple adjacent data points. And so here, for example, um, if you were to just look at IID classification, this, this set of data points is likely the, the same event here. Um, but uh, this classification would only look at the, it essentially ranks um, the data points according to um, their, their, uh, their intensity levels. And so that's going to be undesirable as well. So a nice way. Uh, it, it, to, to approach this is with hidden Markov models, and we've seen huge amounts of activity in the literature. Um, this is an old slide that I really need to update, um, but um, but there there have probably been 25 different approaches now published in the last uh, I would say eight years on hidden Markov models, and uh, and there's still I think two camps. I mean, people generally people um, fall into two two classes. So people that like parametric models where you can actually get interpreted, interpretable output at the end. So you make some assumptions, but then the actual data uh, that comes out is interpretable. So here you have a, seg uh, a segmentation of the data that at the same time finds the breakpoints and also takes those segments and classifies them as loss, neutral, or gain. So, so in, in one algorithmic step, uh, we get these two properties of knowing where the breaks are and, and actually classifying these, um, these segments as being a loss, neutral, or gain. So, uh, and that also allows us to take, for example, um, uh, advantage of the fact that adjacent data points are very likely to be in the same class. So, so for example, here you have, um, you have a loss, a deletion here. And, and all these data points are adjacent. And so, um, so you're more likely to be uh, similar to your neighbor than, than to something else. And so you, one can enforce um, uh, some uh, modeling assumptions on that. The, the problem there is that, uh, of course, we, we do require parametric modeling. It, may, it forces us to make some assumptions. And, and for example, we've seen um, HMMs are often limited by the, the state space. So we, what a hidden Markov model does is essentially take um, these raw data and tries to classify each point into a fixed number of states. And so that can be, uh, uh, for example, um, you can have homozygous deletion, hemizygous deletion, neutral, and maybe three or four levels of amplification. But we know from, for example, HER2, 
that, in fact, you actually have 100 copies. So if you want to actually um, infer the exact copy number, then maybe a hidden Markov model doesn't scale well because it doesn't, it can't, doesn't have the state space to be able to, to um, accurately represent that. So Andrew's been working on some, um, some models that can actually overcome this. Uh, and uh, it probably won't, it's probably too new to, to t talk about um, in an in educational capacity, but you can ask him on the break about that maybe. Um, and, uh, and so, so, so there, but, but these hidden Markov models do have uh, of a, lot of, a lot of advantages, but they have some limitations as well. So, uh, so here are some, uh, you know, examples of this, and you can read these papers um, for which there are, there's actually software available as well. Um, uh, DNA copy and, and from our group HMM dosage. Um, the key ideas of the DNA copy algorithm, and you'll see this in the literature a lot, there are a lot of people that like this approach, um, is, is that uh, we try to output change points in the data and, and these change points um, are inferred by minimizing the within segment variation. So, uh, so here you have a segment and we try to minimize the variation within that segment and then maximize the variation be between segments uh, or the, the distance between segments. And so the, this algorithm works by, you could, you could put a change point at any point along this, uh, along this, the, the axis. And then uh, essentially then you, through regression type modeling, is it this algorithm optimizes the best place to put those segments to optimize these two these two uh, factors, which is to minimize within segment variation, and maximize between segment variation. Okay, so um, so then the difference between that and hidden Markov models is that um, in it's it's kind of an iterative process in hidden Markov models. So first we start with segmentation. And, and then we alternate that with classification. So we put the breakpoints on, and then we determine uh, what the class of the data points within each segment um, should be. Then we update some parameters, and then reiterate re, uh, that process. And, uh, and the big advantage is, and this is a very simplistic, is that we can really assign semantic meaning to the states um, so that rather than just saying, here we have a segment that has log ratio of 0 0.02, uh, we say that that segment is a neutral segment. Um, or, uh, okay, we have a segment that has log ratio of um, minus 0 0.32, we say that's a loss. Okay, and so, so when they output, um, you get the probability that each probe or each locus is a loss neutral gain. Okay, and so uh, then we have, uh, we go from that into this two dimensional analysis. Yeah. Um, so the DNA copy does that. You don't have to do that in the HMM because it's um, actually is a Bayesian model and, and actually just uses the par parameters of the model to then um, maximize uh, the likelihood of, of that particular um, state space given the data. So it's a different approach. There's no multiple test correcting, there's no p-value calculation. It's a, it's a parametric model whereby you can calculate a likelihood of the data given the model. That's, that's for a deeper discussion. Um, two minutes? Two minutes. How much time, how much do I have left here? I have a lot left? Oh, okay. Okay, that's all right. So, um, <laughs> Good. So that, that means we've had a good discussion. Um, so just a couple of tools here. So, so the, the stuff that I just skipped through is just listing of tools and, and websites. So you can look at that at home. You can ask me at the break, whatever. Um, all right. So, so uh, one nice tool to visualize data uh, is IGB and uh, the integrated genomics viewer. I'm sure you've already been exposed to that already. Um, Andrew's going to give you an example of that uh, and, and how to show that. Um, this is just showing, uh, this is the ERB2 locus here, okay? So, um, so these are in red, uh, the high-level amplifications of ERB2 are shown here. And, um, and then there are literally a thousand cases here, and you can see that um, it's about 15% of the population has these high-level amplifications of ERB2. 
these are deletions, uh, and, uh, and, and I'm going to go over those as well. Um, I'm just going to skip over the stuff. This is the actual GC content and mappability normalization. So you can see that it really is an association between uh, read counts and GC content. And so read counts shown on the y-axis here and then GC content shown on the x is a strong relationship that we can normalize out and we can do something similar for mappability as well. Um, and that's, there are several tools that take into account. And, and this is the effect of that. So, so the very top is uh, these 1KB bins that are unnormalized. Uh, we normalize by GC content, we get a better uh, readout. We normalize by mappability and we get a much more interpretable readout here. Okay. Uh, and this is what it might look like. Uh, we get very nice data from NGS. Okay. So, okay, so let's talk, just finish up with some advanced topics. Um, so somebody asked about uh, copy number from exomes. Uh, here's an example from exome CMB. And, um, and so here's just a Sirkos plot of showing, uh, showing how one can infer a copy number from exomes. Uh, again, I would say that the reliability of this is still yet to be um, determined, but sometimes people generate exomes and then want to just take advantage of the fact they have this data. Can I get more information out? So at the primary goal of exomes is maybe sequencing and looking for mutations, but then we have the data, so let's try to take better advantage of it. And, and so one can use a tool like exome CNB uh, to, to pull out copy number changes. And it, it, it uses all the same concepts that I've talked about today. So uh, at the recounts, uh, B allele ratios, etc. Um, so here's another example of um, these will look familiar to you, these plots. So this is controlling for GC content. Uh, for example, and uh, and this is a, a package called Control Freak, um, and uh, by the uh, Emmanuel Barrios group uh, in France, and this is a nice uh, package as well that we've used it. It works. It's nice. Um, so here's this, here's an example of how complex it can get. Um, so uh, this is a, a an example of a tool of uh, chromothripsis. And this was um, a phenomenon that was um, reported uh, a few years ago. And uh, it really shows that uh, in a single uh, cell division event, we can get a chromosome that shatters, essentially, into hundreds of pieces. And then through uh, non-homologous end joining and through other repair mechanisms, essentially get stitched back together, uh, but in a scrambled way. So all these arcs here at the top, represent rearrangements where you have a shuffling of, of that genomic material. And you have uh, copy number losses alternating with copy number gains in, a, in this kind of sawtooth pattern. And, uh, and so this, this can get uh, extremely complex. And, and again, um, none of the methods that I've talked to you about today um, would, would be able to, to, to find this. But, um, but Andrew and, and others uh, uh, out there have, have been, able, been, been developing methods to, um, to really try to profile and identify these um, complex uh, rearrangements. O only in the cancer cells, yeah. So here's an example of one that's useful. So um, neuroblastomas are, of course, uh, childhood brain tumors. And <coughs> they actually tend to be devoid of mutations. So a lot of people ended up trying to sequence these, these childhood brain cancers and found that they, they, they were barren mutational landscape. So they went through this process of sequencing these genomes and didn't find any mutations, and it was just incredibly frustrating. Uh, and this group actually uh, looked at chromothripsis and found that in fact, uh, there was a subpopulation of, of, of these tumors that exhibited this pattern of chromothripsis and, and actually were as, uh, able to associate that with, uh, with inferior outcome. And so we was able to stratify this patient population into a group of, of 10 patients with chromothripsis. You can see that the outcome uh, here for these kids is really, really bad. And, uh, and, and those patients that without the chromothripsis um, had a much better survival. Um, so, so the properties of the genome, just, just that's, this is completely irrelevant of gene content. This is just, does this phenomenon happen? That can be illustrative of, uh, of a phenotype. Yes? So what's the similarity in which, in the, this like? This was the, uh, com this is the complete genomics paper from uh, a couple years ago. So when there, when you find like, what appears to be like, 
like at the end of where things are broken, you know, when that sort of show up as it does, does things more pairing up from the leader? So, yeah, so often there, there are insertions of, of nucleotides um, right at the edges yeah. of, of these, and that, that, so that's needed by non-homologous end joint. Wait, did that show up as mutation? I'm, I'm saying, I'm trying to figure out how come you can see any uh, um, Yeah, so, uh, I, you know, I have to look into the paper okay. again. The, the main point of the paper is that this is a, a, a an event, a, a, a characteristic of the, of the genome okay. that's, um, irrelevant to gene content. It's it's the it's the whole pattern across the genome that matters here, and and that was prognostic um, in a major way. Um, okay. Yes. Is there a um, is there a benefit in actually characterizing what's going on because there's too much information, like to to try to decode you know, the brain? Oh, in in chromatopsis, yeah. um, I don't. That that would be very very difficult. I mean. It's like in trying to interpret a uh, hypermutator um, uh, case, so where you have a mismatch repair protein that leads to log orders more mutations than, than what you um, expect in a, in a timber without efficiency. And so you get um, literally you get, uh, 10,000 total mutations. And so how does one interpret that? Oh, yes, like the passenger is sort of foreshadowing the drug. Exactly. So, yeah. so we'll talk about passenger driver um, this afternoon, but but that, that that's kind of analogous. So chrome versus is like a hyper container of, of the top of the world. Yeah. Okay. So Michelle wants me to stop. So okay. I'm gonna stop. So, so we're gonna do uh, group picture now before coffee break. Do you want to Can I can I just yeah. say one thing here? Yes. Okay. And then then we'll then we'll finish. Finish. Okay. So <laughs> so. Uh, this is a nice uh, study by uh, Nick Navin uh, a few years ago, who actually looked at single cells of uh, breast cancers, so isolated different populations of cells, and, and actually was able to profile the copy number of those different cells. And, uh, and so what, what he found is that um, there were three distinct populations that segregated according to their copy number profile. So this is within one tumor, okay? We have this population of cells that exhibit really quite dramatic, different, dramatically different copy number profiles. So, so just to make the point that copy number profiles can actually be used uh, to study uh, clonal evolution and uh, intratumoral heterogeneity, and and so they become really important markers of clones, and can then be used to to characterize the mixture of populations that exist uh, in a tumor. And we'll talk more in detail about that this afternoon. So let's just wrap up then and say, just to say that the genome architecture is a fundamentally important aspect of studying the cancer genome. Um, that somatic copy number alterations uh, change the gene dosage and can drive expression of oncogenes and tumor suppressors. And uh, there are multiple different platforms, uh, genotyping arrays, whole genome sequencing. Um, and, and the properties of the genome revealed through copy number profiles actually can indicate the important phenotypic characteristics of cancers. So, uh, so hopefully I've convinced you of these uh, things, but you can also ask me uh, throughout the day uh, if there's something that I wasn't clear about. Um, here's a list of tools, and now we can take a break. Yeah. So. <laughs> okay.